All right, hi everyone. Welcome to the CPV seminar. Um, today, it's, it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Jack Devlin, who's uh, from CERN. Uh, in particular, uh, he works on the, the BASE uh, experiment, um, which is a, a really uh, fascinating experiment, which is um, doing a lot of really interesting measurements from precision physics to um, applications to the, the cosmic frontier and dark matter and things like this. Um, so Jack originally got um, his undergraduate degree from, from Oxford before moving to Imperial. Um, and then he, he held positions at, at CERN and also Recon, which uh, is involved with the, um, the, the, the base uh, collaboration. Um, so Jack is an experienced uh, experimental physicist, and we've been trying to get more and more experimentalists in, on in these talks to, to learn about some yeah, real stuff <laughs> as opposed to the fake stuff, which we usually hear about from tourists. So thanks, Jack, for, uh, for being with us. And um, why don't you take it away? Kieran, thanks very much for this uh, this really great inter uh, introduction, and I'm I'm very happy to be uh, presenting this work here today, um, and hopefully tell you a bit more about, as as, as Kieran said, the base collaboration and the types of measurements that we're doing. So, um, so um, I, I've I've titled this talk um, "Pushing the Precision and Cosmic Frontiers of Fundamental Physics" because it's kind of going to be a talk in two halves. Um, in the first half, I'll tell you a bit about the precision measurements that base makes. Um, that's really you know why the collaboration started and and why we have a major center of activity at, at, at CERN um, and then in the second half of the talk I'll kind of tell you a bit about how um, more or less as a sort of inadvertent byproduct of trying to build a better and better device to study the properties of, of protons and antiprotons um, we realized that uh, we can make all sorts of other interesting measurements um, looking for dark matter and other exotic physics. So the second half of my talk will be coming more onto that. Um, I, I suspect given the audience, you'll probably find that half more interesting, but, but maybe you'd also be interested in, in just the general setup because um, uh, that might spark some ideas about different kinds of measurements that can be done with the types of things we're measuring. Um, and uh, and I, I think it's really cool physics, so I hope you'll agree. And um, uh, I, I, I hear that normally, um, you're open to people kind of um, unmuting themselves, inter uh, interrupting, that kind of thing. That's totally fine if you want to do that, if something's not clear um, or I haven't explained something. Sometimes I can I can go quite quickly, I, I know, and and, um, and and that can be hard to, to follow. So just stop me if, if I don't make any sense. So, yeah, so so the, the outline is something like this. Um, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to base, who we are, uh, where our experimental areas are, and um, the kind of the, just the nuts and bolts of the, the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, then I'll cover the, the, the sort of two leading precision measurements that we do, which are a comparison of the proton to antiproton charge to mass ratio, and a comparison of the proton to antiproton magnetic moment or G factor. Um, and these are very interesting as they're um, the most precise way to test CPT symmetry um, with, with baryons, basically. Um, and as you'll see, we can also do interesting other things with the data other than just CPT symmetry. And then I'll come on to explain how we can look for a dark matter with the tools of base, focusing on axion-like particles. Um, but there are also other, other proposals and other ideas that members of the base collaboration are exploring um, to look for different types of dark matter. Um, time's a bit short, so I can't really go into everything that we might want to do here. but. Um, but, but of course there are other kind of irons in the fire there. And then at the end, I'll just touch briefly on um, where this project's gonna go in the near term with the, the base CDM, uh, cold dark matter um, experiment that we're, we're in the process of, of setting up um, and give you some sort of um, medium term or short term um, ideas about where we might end up with that, with that experiment. So, so base. So, um, BASE is a, a, a collaboration between uh, a number of, of research institutes. It's led by, by RIKEN, which is a Japanese institute. Um, and, uh, and, and that's where the, the spokesperson, Stefan Ulmer, that's, that's, that's his sort of center. Um, but it brings in other collaborators and um, it has major experimental areas at the University of Mainz, uh, where um, the experiments to, that work on protons basically are based. So that's the proton G factor measurement, uh, the implementation of, of laser cooling, coupling uh, protons to beryllium ions, and, uh, and also the development work at the moment for a transportable antimatter trap, which is the base step project led by Christian Smora, who's uh, this person here on the left. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, then uh, at, at CERN, we have um, everything that's connected to antiprotons. So uh, that's where the antiproton G factor measurement and the charge to mass me uh, measurements are conducted. Uh, the, it's one and the same apparatus, but with some slight differences depending on the type of measurements we're doing. This is where the transportable trap 
uh, base step will come to receive its antimatter uh, before it gets taken away to somewhere else, uh, maybe somewhere else in CERN or in Mainz, wherever that happens to be. And it's also at the moment where the, the base, the, the dark matter experiments are, are being developed. And then the last site of kind of experimental activity uh, is at Hanover PTB. That's this effort is led by, by uh, Christian Ospelgaus. Um, and there the idea is eventually to um, try and implement a kind of... Uh, oh, sorry. I haven't. We have to do that paperwork. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony. Okay, never mind. Um, so, so the the goal there will be eventually to couple um, uh, uh, beryllium and um, and protons uh, and implement a kind of quantum logic style readout of the spin state and, and sort of a bit like the aluminium ion clock, um, but but in a in a penning trap. So that's kind of very far future uh, where this um, experiment might end up. And here you can see a little map, and of course there are all these other institutes that contribute uh, funds and researchers. So we're we're really quite a big um, collaboration in in compared to atomic and molecular physics experiment, uh, but not so big uh, compared to you know one of these big particle detectors at CERN. Um, so so that's us. So um, I, I, for this talk, I'm going to talk mostly about the activity that's going on at base CERN. So um, here's a little illustration of 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 where we are relative to CERN for people who who might be familiar about it. Um, from from other perhaps more famous experiments. So um, here's, here's, here's Switzerland, there's Geneva. Um, if you could see it, if it wasn't buried under the ground, you would see the, the LHC, there's Geneva Airport just in the in the in the bottom corner of this picture. Um, and uh, one of the, the the sort of a major site where um, all the, the cafeteria, the workshops, a lot of stuff is uh, on the Franco-Swiss border um, is the, the Merin site in CERN. And as well as the LHC, there are also these other um, accelerator decelerator complexes, and one of them is the antimatter factory. So um, this is a, a, a unique facility where we have access, where CERN provides us with um, low energy uh, antiprotons, and we can either study them directly, uh, as we do at base CERN, uh, or other collaborations combine these to make um, anti-atomic systems. So uh, anti-hydrogen, the alpha collaboration, um, uh, has a lot of success in measuring um, the fine structure and, um, and, and 1s, 2s uh, transition of, um, of antihydrogen. And you also have experiments that look for the um, influence of uh, gravity on antimatter. So here's a little plan of the, of the accelerator decelerator complex. And um, we get um, antiprotons that are produced by, by pair production, by colliding uh, protons on a tungsten iridium target. Then CERN very kindly, um, does two stages of deceleration to uh, take them uh, down to 100 kilo electron volts. And then we're able to uh, degrade them through a, through a thin um, foil. Uh, it's a sort of um, a coated mylar foil and then store them in a trap. Depending on the experiment, um, you can either do, uh, th this beam will, will, will come every few seconds and you can either do experiments on the beam or in the case of base, we actually take a shot of antiprotons and then we store them in this trap and we can store them uh, for al almost indefinitely because we don't see any losses. It's a cryogenic trap and the pressure is so good uh, that you don't see losses due to uh, particle collisions or anything like that. And in fact, I won't talk about it today, but we can use that um, to set a direct limit on the antiproton lifetime just by the fact that we don't observe particle losses at all in our trap. Um, in fact, the only time we lose particles are when we make some mistake in the manipulations that we're doing and the particle loss rates are maybe one a month. Uh, at the moment, we, we, we're, we're loaded with protons at the moment, but, but I think this particle is currently um, getting close to three months that we're operating on the same particle in the trap. So um, it's really a, a very well isolated, very well controlled environment where you don't lose particles. And, and this, this trap that we use to, to catch them and to store them, this is the reservoir trap. So um, I'll explain a little bit about how this picture is generated but for now all, all, all i want you to say all i want you to know is if you see this little dip here that's a good sign that means your trap's full of um, antimatter and um, the record at the moment for storage of these antiparticles is about uh, 405 days um, and that's 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 the sort of tool in the trade we can we can keep them in this trap and extract individual antiprotons and do measurements on them so so the reason BASE was created, or the reason why BASE exists, is to um, compare the properties of protons and antiprotons, and that's a precision test of CPT symmetry. So we really have two kind of core measurements. Um, the first of these is a comparison of the proton to antiproton charge, mass, charge to mass ratio, 
And we're able to do that with 16 parts per trillion uncertainty. And that comes by comparing the cyclotron frequency of the particles in the penning trap that we have here. And then we also compare the proton to antiproton G factor, and that we do at the parts per billion level. And that involves not only measuring the cyclotron frequency, but also measuring the LAMO frequency. Uh, BASE was the first trap to, to implement the, the so-called double trap method, where we separate the spin state analysis from the precision readout of the, um, uh, of, of, of the frequency of the, uh, of the LAMO transition, uh, and the first one to apply that to antiprotons. And that led to a very big improvement in the, in the precision by which we could measure these moments by about a factor of 3000. So why test CPT symmetry? I don't know quite with this audience how much um, you, I need to motivate this or whether this, you know, this seems kind of totally out there to you. Um, but uh, for me, the motivation starts at the, the basic motivation, which is why it's interesting to study matter and antimatter, which is, as you well know, um, there's a problem in the early universe that we, we seem to have a billion times more matter left over relative to photons. And we don't know why, where this imbalance comes from. And as a result, basically most of the stuff that we see around us today shouldn't exist according to the physical processes that we know about. But all of these models that we, um, so typically what we try and do is we try and look for um, new ways to create an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Uh, and those ways tend to revolve around finding new sources of CP violation. So of course you're familiar with the Sakharov conditions that give a certain set of uh, conditions for when you would expect to create a, an imbalance of matter over antimatter. And one of those conditions is, is a violation of CP. And of course, there are many, many proposals to look for these new sources of CP violation with beyond the standard model theories that have new particles, new interactions, would also lead to electron ele electric dipole moments or neutron electric uh, dipole moments, all, all this kind of very rich physics, very active areas. And, uh, and, and it's part of the reason why it's so active is, of course, it's possible to construct theories which naturally extend the standard model and uh, can accommodate these additional sources of CP violation. But there's a more exotic alternative, which is that we allow CPT violation. So that is, if we have a, a violation of barium number conservation and we have a violation of CPT, then we can also have a, an, um, an imbalance between matter and antimatter. Of course, the big fly in the ointment here is that the standard model conserves CPT. So this, um, this theory is gonna have to be something which breaks the standard model in, in quite a profound way. And it's not just the standard model. In fact, the CPT theorem holds for um, any quantum field theory, which satisfies these rather sort of modest constraints, uh, if you like. So um, you have to have Lorentz and translation covariant Hil Hilbert space, a va vacuum state, field operators that can be associated with point particles, energy positivity, microscopic causality. These all seem like pretty, um, you know, indispensable things if you talk about a field theory, which I suppose is why people don't, don't typically go after this CPT uh, conservation. But of course, we know that these things might not actually be held, might not actually hold in a more fundamental theory that goes beyond the standard model. So for instance, does the incorporation of gravity into quantum mechanics somehow break the assumptions of the CPT theorem? Or if we move from point particles to strings, can we lead to a violation of the CPT theorem? And, and according to this paper, in fact, this can happen to a small degree. But the, it's fair to say that the sort of the chief way in which people are tackling this is to relax the assumption of um, Lorentz uh, covariance and to see what kind of theory pops out. And what you realize is that as soon as you you relax Lorentz covariance, then many, 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 many more terms pop into existence um, in your Lagrangians. And really, I mean, I can't even write them all down. It, I, it, there's, there's wonderful papers where they're, all of these terms are cataloged by Kosolesky and co. And um, they, they run to pages and pages, and they, it's a basically a power expansion in an effective field theory where you have higher and higher order effects. And because there's no constructive theory that tells you you expect to see some CP violation, CPT violation here or there or in this particular sector, the sensible thing as experimentalists, which is what I am, is just we just need to test all of this and see what limits exist. And also, if there are areas maybe where tests haven't been so good in the past, try and devote some experimental effort to improving those areas because maybe something interesting will, will show up. Um, a generic feature of this uh, relaxation is that 
you'll have terms that are both um, Lorentz symmetry violating and CPT symmetry violating. Typically, the Lorentz violating effects, um, you, you can test them more easily with matter systems. But if you look at terms which violate CPT symmetry, then you want to make comparisons between matter and antimatter particles. And these effects also uh, characteristically will have periodic fluctuations as you move, uh, as the Earth move, moves around in its orbits around the sun. So there's a very rich area that you can investigate here, many terms, many parameters, and many different experiments needed to probe this sort of interesting space. So that's all I want to say about motivation uh, on, the, on the CPT symmetry side of things. So now on to the tools a little bit that BASE uses to test this CPT symmetry. And the, the core tool is the penning trap. I was already kind of mentioned this, but just to give you a bit more detail. So a, a penning trap is a superposition of static, electric, and magnetic fields. The magnetic field in our case is, is around two Tesla. That comes from a superconducting magnet. It's a horizontal uh, room temperature bore magnet. You can see a picture of it here. Those two orange things are, are cryostats to cool down the insert that goes into the magnet. So that gives you a, a strong axial field. And this can confine charged particles in the radial direction because they orbit in a cyclotron motion around the radial, around these axial magnetic field lines. Now, to stop them escaping along the magnetic field lines, you need to apply an electrostatic potential. And we do that by applying voltages to these ring-shaped electrodes. And that makes a potential well that confines the charged particle axially. Um, when you have this combination of fields, the particle motion breaks down into three frequencies. You have a, a slightly modified cyclotron motion, which is uh, at a slightly different frequency to the free cyclotron motion before you applied this electrostatic field. And that, in our case, is around 29 megahertz. Then you have an axial frequency, which is defined by, by, defined by the voltages you apply to these electrodes. And that's at about 674 kilohertz for the precision trap. And uh, then you have a, a magnetron drift frequency. And the, the particle executes this kind of wiggling motion where you have two, two sort of radial circular motions and then a, an up-down oscillation, which is the axial mode. If you take the sum of the square of these frequencies and the square root, that lets you get back to the free cyclotron frequency via this Brown Gabriel's invariance theorem, which even holds in the presence of some, um, uh, some imperfections in your trapping uh, electrodes. And so by getting access to the, the trap frequencies, you can get access to the uh, fundamental properties of the particle. So it's charge to mass ratio. And as I'll explain a bit later, you can modify this setup to also tell you something about um, the, the Larmor frequency of the particle. So base isn't just one penning trap. In fact, it's a stack of penning traps all arranged along a common axis. I already told you about one of these traps before, the reservoir trap or RT, where we keep these uh, antiprotons confined and we can extract individual antiparticles. Then we also have a precision trap. Uh, that's a trap right at the most homogeneous point of the magnet where we carefully um, remove higher order magnetic fields. Now we have a set of correction coils, which can do that even better. And um, we, we're, we also control the electrostatic potential very carefully. And that trap is just all about making very precise measurements of um, the oscillation frequency of the particles and being able to drive Larmor transitions in a very clean magnetic environment where you don't see broadening because you have all sorts of quadratic inhomogeneities or all this kind of thing. But in addition to these two traps, we also need um, an analysis trap which lets us determine the spin state. Uh, I'll explain how that works a bit later. And we have an extra trap, the cooling trap, which is all about trying to couple to the cyclotron motion of the particle and cool it effectively. And that's very important for future um, precision measurements of the antiproton g-factor because it speeds up the measurement protocol um, incredibly. So that's the multi-trap system. And here you can see a little picture of it. These are gold-coated copper electrodes, all stacked together with sapphire, sapphire spacers, and then you have various wires to apply voltages to them, and eventually there are also coils and so on uh, to drive spin transitions that you can't see so clearly. This entire thing goes inside a trap can, uh, it's pumped, cooled down to cryogenic temperatures, and then we have this uh, 10 to the minus 18 millibar pressure where you don't see any particle losses. So um, as well as the trap system, uh, BASE also has these frequency detectors. So everything comes down to being able to measure the, the, frequent, the oscillation frequencies of the particles in the trap. So you need some way of doing this. And um, the way that BASE has adopted is, is to measure the image charge currents as the particles oscillate in the trap. So if you remember from um, electromagnetism, if you have a charge oscillating above a conductor, 
then that induces image charges in the conductor. And now, um, if you think about um, a charge, uh, an antiproton oscillating near to one of these electrodes, this is one of the correction electrodes that we have here, then um, this would induce a charge in it. But what you want to do is kind of connect a, a resistor so that you, 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 you turn this charge into a voltage that can then be amplified. The trouble is that the ring electrode has a certain capacitance. So what you need is an inductor to cancel that capacitance. And you want a very low loss inductor um, such that you, 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 know, you don't, um, well, you just want a low loss inductor. So to do this, you have a toroidal coil, which is niobium titanium wire. You can see a little picture of it on the right hand side here, uh, wound around a PTFE former and placed inside a niobium titanium housing. Uh, this is for the for measuring the axial frequencies at this 670 odd kilohertz. We also have a different set of um, detectors, which I won't talk about, which are all about measuring the cyclotron frequencies. And these work at this higher 13, uh, 29 uh, megahertz frequency. So the combination of the, um, the, the capacitor and the inductor make a parallel LCR circuit. On resonance, that just looks like a resistance and the particle is able to to dissipate its image current over the resistor leading to a voltage which you can then detect. Because it's an LCR circuit and it's at a finite temperature of, of a few Kelvin, uh, 4 Kelvin or 10 Kelvin depending on the electronic heating, uh, this thing also has Johnson noise. So if you just look at a spectrum of the noise of the detector um, without any particle or anything, then you just see its, uh, its characteristic impedance um, Given by the uh, given by the which gives you a, a Johnson noise, which is proportional to the real part of the characteristic impedance. And here you can see a, a, a plot of one of the axial detectors. This is for the analysis trap, uh, which shows you this this impedance feature. Uh, so later on in the talk, when I talk a bit about um, dark matter detection with base, it's these detectors that we're going to use to to look for axion like particles. So I think that's basically everything I want to say about the nuts and bolts of the experiment. Um, there's obviously a lot more detail, but, um, but I think it's probably best if I go on to talk about some, some results. So um, I'll just tell you a bit about our most recent result, which was comparing the charge to mass ratio of the, of the proton and the antiproton. And the first thing to say is that actually we don't compare the charge to mass ratio of the proton and the antiproton. We instead use an H minus ion as a proxy for the antiproton, uh, for the proton, sorry. And then we relate the mass of the H minus or the charge to the mass of the H minus ion to the, to the charge to the mass of the, uh, of the proton, because we know uh, the various contributive factors to the H minus ion. So this is a, a proton with two extra electrons. So we have to correct for the mass of those electrons, the binding energy and the polarizability of this, uh, this um, atom. Uh, and, and as a result, we know the theoretical expectation for the ratio between the H minus ions and the antiprotons, and we can compare our theoretical um, prediction with the measured experimental value. Uh, the sequence to do this measurement is pretty simple. Uh, we extract an H minus ion, and these are produced by, uh, when we load the trap, some fraction of the particles that we have are normally H minus ions produced by dissociation of hydrogen, uh, molecular hydrogen somewhere. And um, we can extract those ions sort of uh, randomly, we, we, we can tell what we've extracted because the mass is slightly different. So we can engineer it so that we extract an H minus ion and an antiproton. We start by putting the H minus ion in a, in a park electrode. This is just some, some electrode away from the center of the trap. And then we make a measurement of the cyclotron frequency of the antiproton. And then we just shuttle the ions, we exchange their positions. And then we make a measurement of the H minus cyclotron frequency. Of course, we do it in this way because what we want to do is cancel the magnetic field so that we're measuring the, um, the cyclotron frequencies in the same magnetic field. And then by taking the ratio of cyclotron frequencies, we get access to the ratio of charged masses. So that's the essence of the measurement. And um, in about, um, it takes about four minutes to do one of these comparisons. And we reach an uncertainty of somewhere between 0.5 and 1.7 parts per billion every time we make one of these frequency comparisons, depending a bit on the me method that we use um, to do the frequency comparison. Here, here's a little plot of um, the, the data that were acquired that went into the paper that came out earlier this year, which set the new best limits on the charge to mass ratio. These were acquired over a, a period of, of a year and a half. There are over 24,000 data points using two different methods to determine the, the cyclotron frequency. So. Um, one of them, the particle was in, in thermal equilibrium with the detector, 
what's called the sideband method and another used an excited particle and registered its its excitation on a cyclotron detector that's what we call the peak method uh, the peak method is slightly um has slightly lower statistical uncertainty but they have different systematic errors uh, the peak method is is at a slightly higher energy so you need to correct for that energy um, but the take-home message is that we have two complementary methods with different systematic errors and we can combine those together and find that the ratio between the proton and the antiproton is consistent with cpt theorist symmetry to 16 parts per trillion uh, as well as doing this CPT symmetry test, um, we can also say something about the effect of gravity on uh, antimatter. So the idea with this is, let's suppose that CPT symmetry is good, but something strange happens as soon as we bring particles into a, a gravitational field. So in the, in the absence of any gravitational potentials, um, matter and antimatter clocks would tick at exactly the same rate. But now by virtue of the fact that we're conducting this experiment in some gravitational potential, that leads to some module some modulation and as a result the matter clock ticks at a different rate to the antimatter clock so in the past what measurements have done is use the the gravitational potential of the local galactic supercluster as if you like the potential that this experiment is sitting in um, but what we were able to do for the first time with this measurement because we, we took data over such a long extended period we could actually look for um, modulations as the earth orbits around the sun in the um in, in in the cyclotron frequency of the proton relative to the antiproton and constrain whether this modulation in the gravitational potential led to a change in the cyclotron frequency which could be attributed to a, a differential influence of gravity on matter compared to antimatter so this measurement is at about the three percent level on this um alpha gd parameter which is written up here and this is a similar level to the types of constraints that experiments at CERN's AD, which are kind of purpose built to study the effect of gravity on antimatter, um, such as Alpha uh, and GBAR in their first generation of experiments, they're aiming at about a 5% on uncertainty. Of course, it's a different kind of experiment. Those ones are gonna drop antimatter in the Earth's gravitational field and see, does it go up, does it go down? What's the effect of gravity on antimatter? This is a clock comparison, which comes with different assumptions. Um, but in some sense, they're, they're kind of complementary measurements investigating the same sort of uh, phenomena. And we leave it a bit up to the theorists to kind of wrangle amongst themselves as to how, how to interpret these, these different ways of measuring uh, related concepts. So uh, that's all I wanted to say on the charge to mass ratio measurement. And now I'll just very briefly tell you a bit about um, the, the, the antiproton G factor measurement. Uh, this is much harder because um, whereas a charge to mass ratio is associated with a cyclotron frequency, which is fundamentally uh, can be fundamentally determined by measuring image currents. Um, to, to determine the, the, the G factor, you have to measure the Lamo frequency. And, and this is a spin precession frequency. It's the rate at which the, the magnetic spin processes in the applied magnetic field. And this isn't associated with the movement of a charge or anything. So you can't just expect to build an image current detector and pick up the motion of the, um, of the particle. Uh, due to the, the Larmor frequency. So you have to find a different way to do it. And, and for a, a, an antiproton or a proton, this is very challenging to, to, to find a way to determine uh, the Larmor frequency. What you basically have to do is try and drive transitions at close to the Larmor frequency and look and see if you manage to drive a spin flip. And if you manage to drive a spin flip and you reach the point at which you, you drive a spin flip with highest probability, um, then at some sense, you've located the center of the Larmor frequency. But then you, you've just translated this into a different problem, which is how can you determine the spin state of a proton and an antiproton? So that to do this, we, we use the same principle that Demelt used in the um, electron and positron uh, G-factor measurements, which is you apply an inhomogeneous magnetic field over the top of your static magnetic field. This gives you a, a field which um, varies quadratically with the position uh, with a constant given by B2. And now if you have a magnetic moment, depending on which way your, your magnetic moment points in the, uh, in the static field, you either see a slightly steeper or a slightly shallower potential. And that means that your axial frequency is modified depending on the spin state. So hooray, you found a way to determine uh, the spin state of the particle, uh, based on an axial frequency measurement and, and axial frequency measurements are image current measurements so so that's great 
the only downside is that compared to the electron, this is about a million times harder because you have a factor of the, the mass ratio and the magnetic moment ratio there. So it's, it's incredibly challenging to do this. And this is why it took such a long time um, to, to, to identify um, proton or anti-proton spin flips. Part of the solution to this problem is you just make a much stronger magnetic inhomogeneity. That creates other problems for you when it comes to optimizing the trap and so on, but, but that's part of the solution. And the second part of the solution is you, you control uh, fluctuations and noise sources on your axial frequencies such that you can resolve the spin flip, which in our case is equivalent to about 170 millihertz. So there, there are sort of two ingredients that are kind of prerequisites. And then the third ingredient that you absolutely have to have if you want to do this with protons or antiprotons is you have to have control over the cyclotron mode of the particle. What you don't want to happen while you're trying to identify the spin state is you don't want the particle to move in its cyclotron state. That's because the cyclotron orbit, it's, a, it's an orbiting charge uh, on a circular orbit, and that's associated with a magnetic moment effectively. So you can imagine if, if this thing is changing in its cyclotron orbit, it's changing its radius, it's changing its magnetic moment, uh, that's a disaster because you're trying to determine a magnetic moment change. So you, you can't have it changing its cyclotron orbit too much. Um, three cyclotron quantum number jumps are equivalent to one hop in the, um, in the magnetic moment, in the, in the spin state. So you, can, you can't tolerate uh, really you know, anything close to that number of hops. And the rate of transition is proportional to the temperature of the particle. So if you can cool the cyclotron particle down to 500 millikelvin or so, uh, certainly below around 200 millikelvin, then you have the basis of a measurement here. It's going to stay stable enough while you're trying to identify its spin state um, that, it's, uh, that it, it's not going to, um, you know, it's not going to hop around and you're going to be able to determine the spin state successfully. As a result of this, um, BASE had to build one of the world's most isolated traps. This plot over here, this is a plot of the, the, the heating rates in the, in the base penning trap. This blue circle here is the, is, is the base trap. And you have a, a selection of different room temperature and cryogenic traps. And you can see that the heating rate is orders of magnitude lower in the base trap compared to all these other experiments. That's not to say that these people are sort of slacking on the job or anything. It's just that it would be impossible to do the measurements the base is trying to do without putting in all this effort to make the heating rates so low. And actually, although I'm not going to talk about it in this, in this talk, some of the collaborators that are part of the, the base experiment are also, uh, 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 have, have also looked into, in collaboration with theory colleagues, ways in which these measurements, these very low measurements of heating rates can also be used to set limits on millicharged particles. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a paper on the archive which you can, you can look into and I can share a link in the chat if anyone's interested to read a little bit more about this application. Um, uh, this isn't something that, uh, that I'm currently involved with, and, uh, and, and, but it is something that members of the base collaboration are kind of investigating. So once you've got this all under control, then you can try and do your, your spin state identification. So as I said, we separate the spin state identification from the LAM or frequency measurements in two different traps. And the first thing we do is try and drive transitions in the analysis trap and look for these jumps in axial frequency. And when we see a big enough jump relative to the noise, then we can conclude what the spin state of the particle is. Then we move the particle to the precision trap. And this is where we try and do our precision drive of the Larmor frequency. So here the fields are very homogeneous, the line shape is very narrow, and you can get a very precise fix on exactly the frequency that you need to flip the spin. Once that's done, you transport the particle back, and then you just do the same procedure as you did initially. You just work out, did you manage to flip the spin state? or did it stay in the same state that it came in as when it, when it left? So as a result of this, you can identify what the frequency that you need to do to flip the spin is in the, in the precision trap. And if you can also measure the magnetic field in the precision trap by measuring the cyclotron frequency and you take the ratio of those two things, then you can determine um, the G factor of the particle. And that's exactly what was, what was done in 2017. And that was uh, able to, um, set um, 3000 fold improved limits on the G factor of the uh, comparison between the proton and the antiproton. The antimatter measurement was conducted at, um, at the CERN experiment and the matter experiment uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Mainz site. Uh, at the moment, the, the team at CERN is preparing for a new measurement of the antiproton G factor and, and gearing up for an improvement on this um, based in part on, on lessons that have been learned from Mainz. Um, we're optimistic that we're, we'll have a there will be a new measurement before too long, 
uh, hopefully you know someone from base can come back and tell you about that if, if you're interested in a few years time so um that's that's the end of the kind of first half of my talk which is all about uh, if you like the the bread and butter of base the the kind of core reasons why the experiment was set up and the 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 the, the stuff that base has kind of historically been most known for and now i want to kind of take a pivot and and go into some of the other stuff that base has more recently become involved with and and that's this dark matter detection and the first thing i want to start with is just one slide which is um, a little bit the bridge between the two camps, which is because we have access to these LAMO frequency measurements on antimatter, we can investigate couplings between antimatter and dark matter, which is kind of a unique thing that BASE can do compared to, um, to, to other experiments. So this was a, um, an analysis conducted by Christian Smora a few years ago now, and the idea is to look for uh, a coupling between um, uh, the, the an axion-like particle field with a certain momentum and the spin of the antiproton. As with a lot of these axion phenomena, this leads to some modulation at the axion's Compton frequency. And you can perform a long time-based analysis of the uh, spin um, or of the antiproton G-factor campaign and try and look for modulations at characteristic frequencies. Of course, because you're looking for um, you know, modulations and these measurements take, take a while to do each individual LAMO determination. Here you're looking at very slow modulations, very low frequency axion-like particles, but it's sort of an interesting thing that in some sense comes for free for doing the, 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 the LAMO um, campaign, that you get access to these kind of interactions and these analyses can be performed. Of course, uh, all the uh, theoretical work and uh, analysis work to actually extract something meaningful from this for this doesn't come for free. There's, there's Christian obviously worked very hard to do that, but this is a sort of natural byproduct of, of, of what the of the de facto campaigns that base conducts. But of course, there's more that we can do. And as you've been listening to this talk, you might have been thinking, oh, this is interesting. We have a lot of ingredients here that sound a bit like a haloscope. So we have strong magnetic fields because we need them to trap the particles. We have high Q LC circuits. Um, the, the highest Q is up to about uh, half a million, um, or, or, uh, but typical Qs, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands. And a kind of unique feature that BASE has is we can bring these LC circuits into interaction with particles. Um, and that gives us some, some tools to determine the properties of the LC circuits, which, which, again, it wasn't designed this way, but it just so happens that can be quite useful in certain types of um, uh, haloscope applications. So um, we, we, when we thought about this, um, we, we looked at the orientation of our detectors and the setup and so on, and we realized that actually we had all the makings of an axion haloscope here. And in particular, the axial detectors that we have um, are, are, are orientated in such a way that it's possible to um, use them to look for axion-like particles. And the, 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 um, the, the physics behind this is just kind of, in essence, the physics behind this um, Sikavi proposal for a few years ago, I'm sorry, this, this, this date isn't right, I think it was 2014 that this paper was published, or maybe 2013. Um, and that's a, that's a proposal to use a resonant LC circuit to look for a very low mass axioms. The general idea is that you have this familiar interaction Lagrangian, which couples axioms to regular electromagnetism. And in the limit that you have a device which is very small compared to the axion wavelength, the predominant way in which this, this interacts is by generating um, magnetic fields which kind of uh, circulate around the applied strong static electric field, uh, st static magnetic field, um, and the, the frequency of these fields is, is again um, the frequency of the axion Compton uh, frequency. So all you need to do is put some kind of pickup coil uh, in such a way that uh, these magnetic fields link flux through the coil and then look at the uh, the voltage that, that, that sort of developed over this coil and you can use this to set limits on the the axion photon coupling that's exactly what we have in our toroidal detectors we have this toroidal coil so we're all we're all set uh, the resulting signal that you would expect to see if you detect a, an axion like particle is a very sharp peak um, whose width is given by the characteristic frequency width of the axion signal uh, of a, about a part per million, superimposed onto the Johnson noise um, feature of this resonant LC circuit. Uh, so here you have some expressions that give you a little bit what the type of signal that you would expect to see from the axion is and, and, the, and the resonator background, which is just 
this Johnson noise on the right hand side here and a, a certain kind of noise floor which is set in which is set by the input noise of the amplifier. So um, a lot of the, these things you can kind of calculate beforehand or you have access to their sort of geometrical factors or you can measure directly um, by for instance measuring the Q factor of your detector. Um, but one thing that can be a bit tricky to pin down is the, is the, the electronic temperature of this system. And the, the temperature in some ways is kind of important because when you do your, um, your analysis, what you don't see is of course a nice sharp peak that you would attribute with, a, uh, with an axion signal. Um, typically you, you just see noise and uh, you're trying to relate the magnitude of this noise to, um, to, 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 to the axion signal to, to set limits. And if you don't know the temperature of your detector, it's very hard to know how you're going to set those limits. So there's always going to be a bit of uncertainty here. But here's where the particle comes to the rescue a little bit. Because you've got this particle interaction with the detection system, and you have, via the mechanisms that you need to determine the antiproton spin state, access to the temperature of the particle, you can determine the temperature of your detector. So this is what I call a Boltzmann thermometer. Maybe there's a better name for it. But in essence, you know, I said before that we have this particle dissipating energy onto the, um, the detector, but of course the detector acts back onto the particle. And so the two systems come to a thermal equilibrium uh, be between the two of them. So if you have a way of measuring the particle temperature, you have a way of measuring the detector temperature. And the way of measuring the particle temperature, it, in essence, um, the axial mode should already have some kind of thermal distribution given by the Boltzmann distribution. Um, but it, it can be tricky to resolve this because in a homogeneous trap, all the different axial energies um, oscillate at the same frequency. So you need a different way. And the way you use it is, of course, using the fact that the particle also has a magnetic moment. So in this case, rather than using the cyclotron motion, we use the, the magnetron motion um, as the magnetic moment that we're interested in, in, in kind of measuring. And what we do is we thermalize the axial and magnetron modes with an RF drive so that the distribution of energy in the axial mode gets mapped onto a distribution of energy in the magnetron mode. So now we have kind of a, a statistical distribution of different magnetic moments associated with these different magnetron orbits. And as I described previously, um, the base analysis trap is, is a, you know, a purpose-built instrument to make high precision measurements of um, magnetic moments. So by measuring the distribution of axial frequency shifts, the distribution of different trapping frequencies that these different moments have in the, in the different traps, um, then we're able to basically resolve um, the distribution of, of energies. And by, by fitting a Boltzmann distribution to this, we can determine the, 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 the temperature of the particle. And via electronic feedback, we're able to vary that temperature and we can indeed see, yes, the, the particle distribution um, energy distribution changes as we change this distribution. So we kind of have a very clean way of determining the real temperature of the detector, which then feeds into um, the analysis of our axiom results. So we, we did this analysis um, following the procedure laid out by, by Foster and Co in this, in this paper here, um, where they consider different types of analyses for these kind of um, resonant and non-resonant haloscopes. And um, we were able to set limits which are um, a little bit better than the than the other um, experimental efforts. Um, this um, this is actually a, an outdated um, abracadabra uh, result. They have a slightly better one, which appears on other slides. So this has now got slightly better. But here you can see shaft abracadabra. So um, we're, we're doing a little better. But of course, this is just a, at a particular fixed frequency of the detector, and um, uh, is 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 about a day or two's averaging time here. So um, this looks promising, but of course, it's not the end of the story. Um, here we have um, the um, ADMX slick effort, um, which is doing a little better than, than what we were able to set. Um, here the magnetic fields are a bit larger because um, you know they were they weren't interested in, in also using this thing as a penning trap. So um, they they you know they they just had a purpose built uh, device going up to higher fields. So um, you know they're, they're, if you if you correct for that difference, we're at a comparable level, I would say, to this to this ADMX slick first result. Uh, so that's what we got to in, in this paper that was, was published last year. And of course, um, we're not happy with this. We, we, we want to go further and see, can we improve this, um, this experiment? So that's what I'll talk about just in the last little bit of my talk here. So um, where do we go next? Um, of course, the first thing we want to do is we need to tune the detector. That, that goes without saying. So we have two concepts to do this. Um, the first of this was developed by um, a bachelor's student, um, Freddie Paulson, who um, 
basically built a, a cryogenic capacitor, which is a parallel plate capacitor where you where you change the capacitance by adjusting the spacing of the plates. Uh, it's an all copper device with some PTFE inserts to stop the plates touching and to stop the, the plunger from touching on the uh, on the grounded housing as this thing moves. And um, here you can see a little cutaway picture of it. And here's, uh, uh, here's, here's some pictures of the thing as it's assembled fully in its housing. Um, this is a cryogenic non-magnetic uh, piezo mo uh, stepper motor produced by Smaract. Um, and here you can see it kind of removed from its housing. Um, you can see the motor and this white thing here is a, is a PTFE band that just holds a film that goes on the plate to stop, to stop it touching. In this central plot here, uh, you can take a look at the, at the tuning range here. Um, uh, this, this was a, a, around um, 60 or 70 picofarads um, of capacitance that we were able to apply here uh, with a, a parasitic capacitance of about 10 picofarads. And as you tune this device, you see that the, the quality factor doesn't really vary um, uh, you know, significantly over the range. So we have a kind of lossless device here to tune the quality factor. And just for fun, here's a kind of plot of some, um, some resonances as they're being tuned to demonstrate the kind of thing that we would do in, a, in an axion search where we would kind of tune the resonance of the particle uh, of the detector and uh, look for axion signals over a, a broader bandwidth. Um, this is great. But it, it takes up a lot, quite a lot of room because you, not only do you have to have um, the the length of the detector, but you also have the kind of the length of the capacitor, but you also have to kind of have the same length so you can pull the plunger out. And all the tuning is basically kind of in the last sort of millimeter or so. So to kind of go um, beyond this, um, Peter and Phil, um, uh, uh, Peter's a, a CERN fellow and, and, and Phil is a, a bachelor student, developed a, a different concept um, which is based around a rotary capacitor. Uh, this might be familiar to any of you who've kind of looked into these rotary capacitors. Um, this is basically a set of, of, of half um, cylinder uh, uh, sort of plates that are all connected together that stay still and another half that rotate around them. And um, you vary the capacitance by keeping the separation between the plates uh, fixed, but by changing the amount of overlap between these two rotating parts. Here we get a, a larger capacitance range uh, slightly higher parasitic capacitance uh, and a much more compact design so we don't take up you know space in in the magnet or the surrounding space by by, by these tuning elements and so on uh, so um, so we're really happy here that we have two different concepts to tune the detector and of course um, the next thing is to try and build this up into a, a into a dedicated experiment which is this base CDM base cold dark matter concept that we're that we're building at the moment so um, as a first attempt, what we're going to do is have um, three different detectors that uh, focus on different frequency bands, uh, one of which is a kind of scaled up version um, operating at, um, at around 200 kilohertz. Then we're going to have another version which is going to go slightly lower in frequency and a slightly higher frequency detector. Uh, the exact parameters of these are being kind of worked out. Uh, you can see uh, the sort of the, the status of the, the coil that we've wound. This is this toroid, which uh, which is about 20 centimeters long. Again, on a on a PTFE former, uh, put inside this case just a copper housing for now. And we're looking into different kinds of coatings and so on that we might want to put inside this copper housing. Um, and here you can see a, a, a picture of the high frequency um, coil uh, with the with the associated tuning capacitor. Um, so these are kind of the, the sort of modest uh, goals with um, with with a, a five tesla field, which the magnet can also produce, and a modest improvement in the noise floor of the of the amplifiers. Um, this wasn't something that we um, that we previously um, optimized very heavily at base because as soon as you can resolve particle signals and you see a clear resonance above the input noise, uh, in some sense you don't win so much by by trying to really develop amplifiers and, trans and look for transistors with the lowest possible input, uh, equivalent input noise. Um, but, uh, but for this device, it's, it's very important because the lower the, the input noise, uh, the broader you can, the broader steps you can scan in. Um, so we have some ideas here um, that we're investigating to try and look for um, lower noise transistors. Um, and um, so in combination with that, uh, the geometry of these detectors, we think this is kind of reasonable in the short term. And then of course, in the longer term, um, you can think about making much bigger devices. You can think about um, doing all sorts of more exotic things. Um, you can swap out the, the cryostats at 4 Kelvin for dilution refrigerators and so on and so forth. So 
Um, there's scope for further improvement here, but this is kind of where we're shooting up for the, for the, the near term. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically brought me to the end, I think, of pretty much everything I wanted to say. Um, I just want to end with a really a tremendous thanks to all the members of the BASIC collaboration. Um, I've presented a lot of results here. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, I, I only contributed a small part to some of them. Um, this is really the work of, of a tremendous uh, inspirational team here with many amazing people. Um, here are photos of some of them. This is the, the BASE CERN team. Um, uh, few months ago. This is from a collaboration meeting and here are some of the other um, PIs at different institutes. Um, I hope I haven't missed anyone off this list um, and uh, just a, a big thank you to, to all my collaborators, all the other members of the base team and all the um, institutes and funding agencies that support us in various ways and, and let us do this exciting work. So thanks very much and uh, I hope you have questions. Thanks Jack, thanks for that uh, very fascinating talk. Um, yeah, I'm sure we, we do have some questions. Does anyone want to want to go first? Uh, there are some rounds of applause. <laughs> uh, maybe I can I can kick things off. Um, so maybe start with the, just the, the slide just before this, the, the future yeah. axion search. Um, so maybe I can just try try to understand. So the um, is, is there a reason why um, you, you can't go down to, to sort of in, in, indefinitely low frequencies are you not sensitive to like a like a dc induced magnetic field or no no you, you you can certainly go down to lower frequencies it's just a compromise over um you know um so so you know it's, it's how you parcel up the scanning time yeah. and you you can you can see that a little bit this these two bits here the blue these two blue ones this is just do you kind of concentrate on a very narrow area and you scan that for a very long time or do you try and do a broader yeah. area of course, at some level, you're limited by the capacitor that you've got. So you, you can't tune with one device. You can't tune to, tune to indefinitely low frequencies um, without um, having a you know indefinitely large capacitor. So it's kind of a little bit at the choice of the experimentalist wh where you want to investigate and, and what capacitances you want to apply. You know, one idea we had was that of course you need some fine tuning capacitor that you can take um, small steps so that your spectra overlap. But maybe to cover broader spectra, you can have some kind of capacitance bank that you swap large fixed capacitors in, and that would allow you with one device to cover a broader frequency. Uh, there's a separate point, which is if you have a fixed volume and, um, and a fixed uh, area of axiom mass that you want to scan, you know, what's the best way? How should you divide this up? Does it make sense that you build one, one detector? With, um, with a very low inductance and tune that capacitively over the full range, or should you build lots of small detectors? And actually, from what I understand, though I, I could be wrong about this, but my understanding is that the best thing to do is basically build one detector that covers more or less one octave, and then kind of have a separate detector for each octave. That's kind of the best compromise to, to parcel up the frequency space. So that's what we've done here. Um, but of course, that means lots of detectors. So maybe you don't want to do yeah. that if you, if, you, if you have space problems or something. And and this um this gap at around ten to the minus eight EV is that a is that a choice as well or is there some other restriction that, that, that that's just a choice in principle yeah. we could we could have this higher frequency detector move down a bit to lower frequencies you know it's interesting for us to to for for our kind of for the core base experiment to think a bit about um, mm -hmm. detectors operating at these higher frequencies so this kind of fits in naturally with you know other R and D efforts that are going on at, at, at base because. Um, these sorts of things, yeah. these are frequencies yeah. at which um, the cyclotron detectors operate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it kind of, that's that's why we have this gap in a sense, we have mm -hmm. like the axial frequencies and then going down a little bit in frequencies and then we have the cyclotron frequencies mm -hmm. and that keeps a little bit the, yeah, the yeah. technological yeah. exchange between the two detectors. But there's not a there's not a theoretical reason or anything why we can't investigate the gap. And um, so, I mean, I, has there any ever been any serious discussion about what you would need to sort of get down to the QCD axion sensitivity? I mean, that's a big jump, but... Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, the, this is really what the, the um, Abracadabra DM radio uh, yeah. collaboration yeah. In, in, in the States, that's, that's what they're targeting. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they put these projections, um, but it's going to be a big device. Mm. I mean, that's, that's certainly true. Um, you, you know, you, you certainly can do it. There's not, I don't say there's no problem, but it's just you, you will need a very large, um, you know, purpose-built magnet. Um, so uh, at some stage, that would be really nice that we try and kind of go towards uh, 
this as a long-term goal and we're in discussions with um you know with yaxo and, and rades and so on um, for the very far future to see what might be possible mm. with these kind of telescopes and very big magnets so that's kind of on the horizon but i don't know i'm a kind of um <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just an experiment. I, I, I'm, I, pref I prefer to think a little bit on something that I can imagine building kind of in the timescales of a PhD student. Right. And that, that's, that's why I kind of present this stuff. And then if this all looks good and we and the devices perform well, you know, we're already going for something which, from something which is four centimeters uh, to something which is 20 centimeters. Mm -hmm. If that goes well, maybe we can think about going to something that's a meter and then let's take it from there because it starts to get very expensive if you have to have big magnets, I think. Mm -hmm. So, so how long does it take to scan one octave there? Uh, this is one year of scanning time. Well, one year of scanning time, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically in order to scan all three, it would be kind of three years. No, no, the, the idea is here, they sit the set, they sit at the same time in the detector. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of one year of measurement time. That's okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, somebody else want to ask something? Otherwise I'll go again. Uh, it's like, I can ask, um, so yeah, can you roll back all the way to when you were talking about the, um, the, the proton and proton charge mass ratio? Yeah. Um, cause I noticed there was this theoretical, I think it's in the, there's this theoretical, um, ratio that you had, uh, I think it was yes. slides. Okay. Just called this. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Um, so does this, is this, coming from the fact that you're using um h minus rather than than protons is that yeah that's exactly it yeah, yeah. so does that does that then impact your your experimental measurement or is your position it, it, it yeah not 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 at all at the moment so so it's it's far below the precision that we I see. Um, okay yeah yeah to. so 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 this isn't a limitation at the moment um and it's much better to do it this way because uh, i don't know if i said but if you try and use um protons and antiprotons directly uh, what happens is you need to use different trapping potentials because the yeah. protons negative, anti -proton, uh, sorry, protons positive, anti protons negative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what that means is that if your field isn't perfectly homogeneous, which of course in the real world it never is, you always have some gradients, then the particles sit at slightly different magnetic fields. And, and it turns out that uh, this is more troublesome than, um, mm. than, 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 the, um, than the type of effect um, that, than, than, than this kind of uh, uncertainty in the theoretical um, value, which which is which is known, you know, far mm. better than it's, than it's required. So, um, actually, you know, in the in the early days of the um, experiments uh, at at, at ATRAP or, or by the ATRAP collaboration at, at CERN, they really did compare protons and antiprotons, and and I think kind of just by I, I don't know if there was ever a design or just by chance or something, they 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 realised that this was actually that these H minus ions were also here, and mm. this was also a way that you could you could do the measurements. So. Um, and that that led to a big improvement in precision. And since then, all the all the uh, charge to mass ratio comparison experiments have all done it this way. I mean, <laughs> I say all, you know, there are only two, but like that, that, that's the way it's been done. Mm -hmm. would, would that, would do you know what that theoretical uncertainty comes from? Is that, would that be an interesting thing to try and improve with experimentally? Um, it, it basically, I mean, theory is a bit strong here, you know, um, when I say theoretical, it's it's really these are measurements. These are measurements of of the electron to proton mass, the binding, oh, I see. Yeah, the yeah, okay. and so on. So it's not like um, you know, there is a calculation in this um, alpha, this polarizability factor, but again, it's reference to measurements. Hmm. So yeah, at it. some stage, if we get, you know, it, it's it's that's why we we have an interest in you know continuing to improve these these experimentally measured quantities. Um, and if at some point these things are known well enough, then there might be grounds to revisit this this mm. alpha factor um, and see if if this can also be done. But again, this this isn't just a number that exists in the vacuum without reference to um, mm. to spectroscopy or anything. This also kind of comes yeah, in part yeah, through yeah. through spectroscopic measurements. So um, so you know, as as we improve, there's also then Im impetus for other people to kind of continue improving these numbers. uh well i yeah it's made, so i had a couple of questions just right at the beginning but i didn't i didn't want to yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. very very really really simple-minded questions about this the yeah, big, no. global picture of the experiment i mean um i don't know if you said this at any point how many 
how many you say you mentioned that you can you can have these things these antiprotons in there for for like months at a time how, how many Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, you say that right on the slide. Okay, that was my question. It's like, how many of them you actually have? It's like ten to ten to a thousand. And is that? Yeah. The, do you do you choose that, or is that just sort of how many you end up getting from the from the beam? Or? That that's basically how many uh, we end up getting. So, um, you know, uh, I, I actually don't know the the exact mechanics of why it ends up converging to this particular number. Um, you know, there's because these things are positive. These things have, you know. Um, negative charge so if you have a certain kind of dimensions of trap then uh, given the kind of the, the sort of the effective temperature and energy of this particles that that naturally leads you to have a certain maximum number that you can kind of confine a little bit um, but if you I, yeah. I don't know the real details of exactly why that number comes out to be um 10 to a thousand but you know if you think about our particle loss um mm. of, of, of you know, maybe one a month or something if we're doing lots of operations um this kind of number is 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 easily enough to do a measurement campaign so again um you know and also it's it's it's, it, it's quite good in a way because um uh, it's it, it can be a bit disruptive to to constantly be trying to um, extract particles and do manipulations on the reservoir trap so when we have it loaded with antiprotons it's really kind of a totally separate system controlled by a separate computer with separate power supplies that just sits there and you know we, we we don't try and interact with it too much because it's just very stable um the wonderful thing is you know this can resist a power cut we have that the magnet is a superconducting magnet so so long as it's cold um it's not it's not going to change um it's going to keep trapping them radially and and these power supplies that we have used for the voltages these don't draw a lot of um you know a lot of power so we can have them on on batteries so we can easily um you know, cover periods of time when there are unexpected power cuts, which happen all the time oh, um, at CERN when, when yeah. you know, and, and that's very important uh, mm. because, um, you know, in some sense, when we take the beam again, that can change some of the properties of the trap. So we don't constantly want to be taking the beam and, you know, in the middle of when we're trying to do these very careful measurements. And it also, the other great thing it lets you do is you can operate when everyone else leaves. Uh, one thing I, I never mentioned, you know, is um, we're trying to do measurements at parts per trillion uncertainty and then fundamentally they're magnetic measurements these are cyclotron frequency measurements even if they're ratios so you're sensitive to changes in this in the magnetic field and um and, and you're trying to do this in in an accelerator or a decelerator which is constantly ramping its magnetic field uh, on the parts per million level so you've, you've got a sort of six orders of magnitude there that you're trying to bridge and you can do clever tricks to try and do this uh, but it's the, the, by far the easiest thing to do is just to try and operate in a period where the decelerator is turned off. Um, and that's, you know, that's where we get the highest quality data. And that's mm. also what motivates this base step project, the, the one that's kind of led by, by Christian Smora, which is, you know, come in with a transportable trap, load that up with antiprotons and then take that to a dedicated lab where you can have good temperature control, low magnetic field noise and all the right kind of um, properties to really do the next set of measurements mm -hmm. because now we're getting to the point where you know we're really sort of fighting quite hard against just the just the conditions that we have to operate in in the antiproton accelerator and yeah i had another just this is a really just my my ignorance about this these penning traps so when these penning traps you have these three frequencies and they were quite well separated i mean you had one was really low one was in the middle and one was like megahertz or, or something is this is, is this a by design or is this like a, a just a feature of penning traps in, in general that, that you have these two frequencies always very well separated i mean it's 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 generally a feature of penning traps that people actually use for things it's not like an intrinsic feature you can design you know by varying the the strength of the electrostatic potential relative to the magnetic field you can have other frequencies but of course you're you you know there's some limit uh, at which the particle at which the trap no longer is stable so you're not allowed to have absolutely any choice but it's very convenient to have them well separated in this way um, you know, because you 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 you're often interested in driving, um, you know, selectively coupling individual motions, and if they're not well separated, then you can inadvertently drive transitions that you don't want. So you know, it's 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 kind of by design, and it's also um, it also is convenient to use reasonable voltages on your electrodes. So you don't want um, you know, it's 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 comparatively easy. To find low noise voltage supplies that operate up to say plus or minus uh, 15 volts or 5 volts or something if you start having to demand that your um your voltages are you know kilovolts and so on um, then that can be a bit harder 
and you have to maybe work a little bit harder. So uh, again, that that sort of motivates um, choosing, you know, magnetic fields. And again, um, with the cyclotron frequency, you know, it's convenient to have that at a magnetic field where um, it's easy to get function generators and so on and so forth. Uh, in principle, there'd be a slight boost from going to slightly higher magnetic fields. Um, but but yeah, the separation is you know it's very much by design. Um, all right. Well, if there are no final questions. I may I may ask my my just um, sort of uh, no. Well, I'm, <laughs> the the thing I, I'm I'm curious about. So you you mentioned you you're really interested in this from the, the experimental standpoint. You're just this is a, an interesting measurement to do, and you can do it really really precisely. But then, yeah, I mean, you, you had a, a few slides you're talking about, um, you know, probing CPT um, and, and things like this. But has um, have you been sort of contacted by theorists who could give you sort of targets for things to look for? Or have been able to say, OK, now that you've measured this to this position, you've ruled out my this this term in my, um, you know, when I abandoned the Lorentz invariance, this like huge Lagrangian or something. Is, is Have you had contact with theorists about possible theories that you may be exploring? Yeah, I mean, it, it, yes and no. So it, it's kind of interesting. Like, um, I, I mean, I don't know because I don't know the theory field so well. But what my interpretation from going to to some of the conferences is, is that the, you know, that it's kind of there are two complementary approaches. So yes, there are people who are really trying to build these constructive theories, but at the moment they're not really in a position to say how all these things are linked together and where is the like the most interesting thing to study so um as far as i'm aware at least maybe stefan knows otherwise but like you know i i don't know that someone has said to us you know this coefficient this exact thing out of all of these yeah. hundreds of thousands this is the one that you need to measure and this will tell you the answer instead what i think the theorists have, have done um which which is a, a good approach from experimentalist is just to say you know because we don't know the constructive theory let's just try and build a general framework which is what they call this standard model extension that we can accommodate you know whatever theory it is that you're going to want to have it's going to have some some low energy effective field theory approximation a lot of the terms of which are going to be the terms of the standard model and then they're going to be some extra terms with small coefficients that are going to give you this Lorentz and CPT violation and and that I think that was very useful because um, it, it can be quite hard um, to, you know, there are just so many different experiments you can think of doing that are that are sensitive in different ways. And without a framework, you, you're, you're sometimes you, you just don't know, you know, this experiment says we test CPT theorem, this experiment says we do it this way. How do you how do you reconcile these things? How do you fit them all in? And so, you know, that's why the, this this kind of very broad framework where we just try and measure everything and see where we're at with various limits um, has has sprung up. So. Um, I don't, you know, not not exactly is probably the, mm. the, the straight answer to your question, but but that's not to say that we operate in this kind of vacuum where we don't yeah. make contact yeah. with theory. There is like a this broader program of constraining the coefficients of the standard model extension, and of course, you know, um, there may be other ways of doing it. It's it's just very hard for us um, when we're so we, you know we're so within the the kind of paradigm of the standard model to to think about. Um, things that or you know very different things that that maybe don't fit in very well with how we kind of currently conceptualize um physics and and i think just on a kind of just a real basic level we now have access to this antimatter this stuff that really isn't around us is very exotic and, and mysterious in some way and just at like kind of very basic level kind of apart from these theories it's just interesting to study these properties um, mm. And just see, really, really, is it the same as matter that we always assume and we've been told since we since we learned school, or, or could there be small differences there? I, I think that's also just like just on a kind of, you know, just as a curiosity mm -hmm. level. I think it's it's a, it's a very strong motivator. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so I think we can uh, call it close. If there's anyone any final questions, they can. Uh,